I love Kevin Durant as a ball player. He's special, sensational. The league is better when KD is on the floor. Durant returned to the Brooklyn lineup last night after missing the last six weeks with an MCL sprain, and he was vintage KD, pumping in 31 points, flat out majestic in dominance. And the Nets lost while blowing a 16-point lead, which is no surprise because the Nets have been a flat-out mess ever since KD went out. And they've been a mess, let's be honest, on so many levels. But this, this was eye-opening. Durant was back. Durant was amazing. They were playing a Miami Heat team that didn't have three key players. They were fresh off of a meltdown against the Milwaukee Bucks and... Brooklyn still couldn't get it done. And, of course, the Nats didn't have Kyrie Irving because he cannot play at home because of his vaccination status. And in a very related story, Brooklyn cannot win at home as a result. So you had no Kyrie and Ben Simmons. He's got a bad back. The back is sore. And Nets GM Sean Mark said there's no timetable for him to make his Nets debut. And time's running out here. About five weeks left in the regular season. And would you look at this? Brooklyn's an eight seed. You know, I always throw them into the conversation about making a run in the playoffs, making the finals because of KD, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, you look at it and it's difficult to imagine. I mean, if you have Kevin Durant and you have Kyrie Irving and Kyrie went on the court is majestic. I mean, you got to just almost jog them at the Rolodex. And remember, Kyrie is amazing when he's on the court, but Simmons can't play, and when he does play, he can't shoot, and I've played as many minutes on the court with Kevin Durant as Ben Simmons has this season. Look, they're not in the same category as Philly or the Milwaukee Bucks when it comes to winning the Eastern Conference. It's easy to talk about the Nets making a run. Durant is special, but how about the Nets win a game? Or back-to-back games? Or get guys around Kevin Durant who actually love and prioritize basketball? I guess I should have saved my rock bottom for the Lakers rant from earlier this week. The Lakers are just a gutless, unmitigated disaster. And I love Russell Westbrook, but I'm sorry, Russ. Your Lakers are in route to becoming the most disappointing team in basketball history. Simple as that. History of the NBA based upon preseason expectations to place in the standings. And honestly, this is not exaggeration. Honestly, it's the only take. They played the Clippers last night, and they didn't care. I actually thought, shame on me, the Lakers were going to win. I actually thought they would give effort. They haven't won a ball game in the second half of this NBA season. A Clippers win would give L.A.'s little brother the four-game season series sweep over the Lakers. And the Clips got it done. And think about it. Obviously, there's no Kawhi or Paul George. Heck, Norman Powell didn't even play. I mean, you had Zubats and Mr. October Reggie Jackson punking the Lakers. I mean, look at these embarrassing nuggets of futility. You realize the loss to the Clippers marked the 20th time this season. LeBron and the Lakers have trailed by 20 plus points. The 14th time the Lakers have trailed by 25 or more points. Seventh time the Lakers have trailed by 30 or more. I mean, this team doesn't care. All three are the most in a season by LeBron James, a LeBron James team in his career. Gross. Yuck. Since January the 9th, we'll have more nuggets of futility. We got them for you. LeBron's Lakers are tied at the Knicks for the second worst record in the NBA. Only the pathetic Rockets have a worse record. Lakers have lost four straight, seven of eight, to fall to a season worst eight games below 500. They are only two games from being outs in the play-in. I mean, we're talking about a LeBron James team. We're talking about a LeBron James, Russell Westbrook team hanging on to a spot for the play-in, trying to hold off the mighty Pelicans and the Spurs and the Blazers. Just pathetic. Oh, by the way, the Lakers, for good measure, also ranked 26th in the NBA in turnovers and scoring defense. There is no bigger failure in NBA history based upon preseason projection, talent, 
upside. And I don't worry about injuries. Suns, Warriors, Grizz, they've all had injuries. Utah Jazz, injuries. I don't want to hear injuries as an excuse. There's no effort. LeBron James is daydreaming about playing with his son in Cleveland. He doesn't want to stay in L.A. after this year, and the Lakers don't want him. It's one thing to underachieve. LeBron and the Lakers don't care. I love that line from Coach K. It's his senior day, and it really is, and it's all sorts of awesome. The greatest coach in college basketball history is retiring at the end of the year, and tomorrow is his final game ever coaching Duke at Cameron Indoor Stadium, and there's not going to be a dry eye in the house. It's fitting that the game is against Carolina, Duke's hated rival, and it's the best rivalry in college basketball bar none. Do you realize Coach K has won? 88% of his games coaching Duke at Cameron Indoor. 88%. He's 572 and 75 at Cameron Indoor. That's insane. Put that in the mix with the, you know, five national championships, the 12 Final Fours, the 97 tournament wins, and winning the ACC tournament 15 times, and the ACC regular season 13 times. What Coach K has done at Duke over four decades makes him the GOATS. To keep up with the changing landscape of college hoops and recruiting and social media and league and tournament expansion, it's unprecedented with all due respect to John Wooden. Look, he's not done either. I know it's his final year, but Duke still has work to do. Duke is going to destroy Carolina tomorrow, then win the ACC tournament next week, then get a one seed on Selection Sunday on CBS, and then be in position to make the Final Four and cut down the nets. In so many ways, it would be storybook and perfect. Enjoy your day tomorrow, Coach K. You're the best to ever do it. Sean McVay told us yesterday on Time to Shine that the L.A. Rams are very interested in bringing Odell Beckham Jr. back. And it's very timely because it seems like the feelings are mutual. Ian Rappaport, our good friend over at the NFL Network, reports today on the heels of our exclusive with Sean McVay on Time to Shine yesterday, there's mutual interest between the parties in a reunion. And the respect level that McVay has for Odell Beckham Jr. that poured through your television yesterday, he absolutely loved Beckham as a player, as a leader, as a worker. Obviously, Beckham's coming off of that torn ACL. Probably won't be able to play until the late fall. Makes sense for everyone involved. Also, from our friend Ian Rappaport, how about this? The Patriots are not going to place the franchise tag on stud corner J.C. Jackson. And J.C. Jackson is going to hit free agency and the open market. This is a terrible move by the New England Patriots. Look, I will amend the commentary and the criticism if New England signs them to a long-term deal, but I have to imagine a team like Tennessee would be all over him. A team like Pittsburgh would be all over him. You know, Bill Belichick likes to think that he could just put anyone at any position, and I think that it's, and I love Belichick, I think he's the greatest coach in the history of sports, but Listen, that's, that's foolish and it's wrong. J.C. Jackson, you saw the numbers on the screen to watch him play. He's a stud. He's the kind of guy we talked about earlier in the week. You need to pay him if he leaves the New England Patriots. That's a terrible job by New England. The busy day continues for Ian Rappaport. Do you know that Ian Rappaport and I go to the same person who cuts our hair? But I digress. Rappaport reporting that the Dallas Cowboys are going to move on from wide receiver Amari Cooper. They're going to try and trade him. If they can't, they're going to release him. This will save money in terms of the guaranteed salary for Amari Cooper. And listen, I, I think this makes a ton of sense for Dallas because, let's be honest, Amari Cooper is the number two at the wide receiver position as opposed to the number one. C.D. Lamb is, in fact, the guy. Now, they have to make sure they bring back Gallup and they have to make sure they sign their guys at the tight end position, and they have to also consider bringing in another receiver. I mean, let's be honest here. You have Dak Prescott, you know, signing someone like Allen Robinson, a veteran, would make a lot of sense, but 
Cooper will have suitors on the open market. You know, Jacksonville would make a ton of sense. Chiefs would make a ton of sense. But from a Dallas standpoint, I endorse this move. I don't think he's worth the money. Saints GM Mickey Loomis says Jameis Winston is an option for New Orleans, and he hopes that they're an option for Jameis. I believe it. I get it. Here's the educated guess. Both sides want to do better. I think for Jameis, he probably doesn't want to go back to New Orleans because Sean Payton's along with the coach, and it's not Sean Payton as a quarterback and play calling an offensive guru. I think Pittsburgh is the perfect spot for Jameis Winston. And here's a guess from a New Orleans standpoint. Find a great player. Find a star. Find someone who's better than Jameis Winston to, in essence, be that guy who replaces Drew Brees as the face of the franchise. How about Ohio State wide receiver Chris Olave? Put on an absolute show last night at the NFL Combine. A blazing sub 4 yard dash while excelling in the drills. I haven't seen speed like that since our director, Jake, needed to leave after time to shine in order to make his train. I'm telling you right now, I love Olave. This guy is a stud. He's going to be a top 20 pick in the NFL draft. I'm really fired up to see how high offensive line studs Evan Neal and my guy Icky go in this year's draft. I, I think the world of Evan Neal, this guy is an absolute stud, was phenomenal for Nick Saban in Alabama, and Bakwanu is just incredible. And these guys will absolutely both be in the mix and in the conversation for that number one pick in the draft. I still think, as we talked about this week, Aiden Hutchinson is the best player in the draft. But listen, if you have Trevor Lawrence, you have to consider an offensive tackle. And we're talking about two guys that I believe are going to go in the top five of the NFL draft. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the bell for more videos.